When the six-time murderer, Eugen Weidmann, was led to the guillotine in Versailles on June the 17th, 1939, it caused an uproar. Beer and champagne flowed, and there was almost a festival atmosphere in the town. Around 10,000 onlookers populated the execution area and turned night into day. The restaurant stayed open and good profits were made from the drunken revelers. The noise of the crowd could be heard as far as the cells in the Saint-Pierre prison. Eugen Weidmann sat on a hard bench seat in one of these cells. He knew the cheers and jeers were for him. They were celebrating the forthcoming spectacle of his death. His execution was scheduled for the early hours, and he knew no sleep would come. The hysterical behavior by spectators was so scandalous that French President Albert Le Brun immediately banned all future public executions. Eugen Weidmann was not only a serial killer, but also a handsome womanizer. Newspapers compared him to Hollywood star Clark Gable. The French newspaper Paris Soir had sent the well-known writer Colette to Versailles to report on the case. Another movie star, Christopher Lee, shared in his memoirs that when he was 17, he saw the spectacle while visiting Paris. Weidman received numerous love letters from ghoulish female fans while on death row, and it was mostly women who crowded for the best spots around the scaffold. When the condemned man was brought before the guillotine, some of these women reacted hysterically. After the 7 kilogram guillotine blade fell at around 4.32 a.m., several aroused ladies were said to have dipped their handkerchiefs in Weidman's blood. Then, more champagne corks popped. The party could continue. Despite a ban, the decapitation was photographed and filmed. The pictures went around the world. Weidmann's charisma was not based solely on his looks. He wasn't just any good-looking rascal from the streets. He came from a wealthy family and had an air of cultured elegance about him. He spoke, besides German, fluent English, French and some Portuguese. Born in Frankfurt on Main in 1908, he was brought up by his grandparents after the outbreak of the war and found himself on the wrong side of the tracks at an early age. He began with a series of theft offences that earned him five years in prison in the early 1930s. Whilst there, he met Roger Million and Jean Blanc, like-minded criminals who had little interest in a civil working life. Once free again, he teamed up with them. Their plan was to kidnap wealthy tourists visiting France and then murder them.
Their first kidnap attempt ended in amateurish failure because their victim struggled too hard, forcing them to let him go. In July 1937, they made a second attempt. Weidman made the acquaintance of Jean de Coven, a 22-year-old New York ballet dancer, visiting her aunt in Paris. Seduced by his good looks and charm, she wrote to a friend, I have just met a charming German of keen intelligence who calls himself Siegfried. Perhaps I am going to another Wagnerian role. Who knows? I am going to visit him tomorrow at his villa in a beautiful place near a famous mansion that Napoleon gave Josephine. The killers had rented a villa in St. Cloud near Paris to carry out their horrible plan. The relaxed but cold-blooded killer greeted her cordially, and they enjoyed a cigarette together. Siegfried kindly gave her a glass of milk. She took photos of him with her new camera, later found beside her body the developed photos showing her killer. Weidmann, with a graceful movement, put the cigarette out, swiftly strangled her, and then buried her under the front steps of the villa. The group then sent Million's mistress, Colette Tricot, to cash Jean's $430 in traveler's checks, and they divided the 300 francs in cash. Her aunt Ida received a letter demanding $500 for the return of her niece. Jean's brother Henry later came to France offering a 10,000 franc reward from his father Abraham for information about Jean's whereabouts. He had no idea, of course, that his sister was already decaying in a makeshift grave, never having had the chance to give the kind German gentleman a performance from her Wagnerian repertoire. Her body would not be found for another four months. On September the 1st of the same year, Weidmann hired a chauffeur named Joseph Kofi to drive him to the French Riviera. He indicated to the driver his need to relieve himself en route. They stopped in a forest outside Tours. Weidmann then calmly shot him in the nape of the neck and stole his car and 2,500 francs. The next murder happened on September the 3rd, after Weidmann and Million lured Janine Keller, a private nurse, into a cave in the forest of Fontainebleau with the promise of a job. Without further ado, he again employed the tried and tested bullet to the nape of the neck. This time the booty was 1,400 francs and her tiny diamond ring. October the 16th, Million and Weidmann arranged a meeting with a young theatrical producer named Roger Leblond, promising to invest money in one of his shows. Instead of the promised investment, Leblond received a projectile into his brain. The final act was to relieve the dead producer of his wallet, containing 5,000 francs. On November the 22nd, Weidmann murdered and robbed Fritz Frommer, a young German he had met in jail. Frommer, a Jew, had been held there for his anti-Nazi views. Once again, the victim was shot in the nape of the neck. 
his body was buried in the basement of the St. Cloud Villa, not such a great distance from where Jean was quietly mouldering. Five days later, Weidmann committed his final murder. Raymond Le Sobre, a real estate agent, was executed with the killer's preferred method while showing him around a house in St. Cloud. 5,000 francs was taken from him. Officers from the Surete Nationale, led by a young inspector named Primborn, eventually tracked Weidmann to the villa from a business card left at Le Sobre's office. Arriving back at his home, Weidman found the two officers waiting for him. They were pretending to be tax inspectors. Being the perfect gentleman, he invited them into the villa. They climbed over the steps, where Jean patiently waited for justice under the soles of their shoes. Weidman then calmly turned and fired three times at them with a pistol. Although they were unarmed, the wounded detectives managed to wrestle with Weidman finally smashing him in the skull with a hammer that had been placed on a table. Weidmann dropped immediately. Weidmann was a highly cooperative prisoner giving his name as Monsieur Carré. During his interrogation, he was given dozens of French cigarettes to encourage his memory of events. Carré coolly confessed to police that his real name was Eugen Weidmann. He also confessed to the murders of Jean de Coven, who he strangled while she was drinking milk, and Fritz Frommer, who he was afraid was going to talk to the police, Joseph Coffé, Roger Leblond, and Raymond Le Sobre. His motive was robbery. The murder trial of Weidmann, Million, Blanc and Tricot in Versailles in March 1939 was the biggest since that of Henri Desiree Landru, the modern-day bluebird, 18 years earlier. I never lie, he truthfully told them in relating his murder of Leblonde, which, because of his elegant composure, they could hardly believe. Here is the proof, he said, and flipped open his coat to show Leblonde's suspenders, which he was wearing. He had also saved the press agent's incriminating cigarette lighter, watch, and gold pencil. He had also kept Madame Keller's blonde wigs for Colette Tricot to use as a disguise, he claimed and Le Sobre's small shoes, which he neatly preserved on a shoe tree. Kofi's limousine and Le Sobre's sedan had also been found, neatly parked and with a light covering of December snow in the villa's backyard. Weidmann and Milion received the death sentence, while Blanc received a jail sentence of 20 months, and Tricot was acquitted. Milion's sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment. Six innocent people had lost their lives 
for what should be considered a rather paltry sum of money. The suave German might have thought of himself as a criminal mastermind, but his bungling by leaving so much evidence behind and holding on to the victim's possessions revealed the stupid greed of a vicious small-time crook. Before Weidmann's head rolled away from the rest of him, he had taken the time to express the only regret he had. It was for the trusting ballet dancer. He said tearfully, She was gentle and unsuspecting. I enjoyed speaking English to her, which I learned in Canada. When I reached for her throat, she went down like a doll. Well, my dear friends, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. What did you think of Eugen Weidmann? Were the ladies in my audience attracted to his film star good looks? He might have had a handsome facade, but the interior was something akin to a reptile. Scary. I translated the letter uh, here that you see on the screen. As far as I know, it hasn't been done yet. I looked on the internet. It doesn't really say much about his relationship with his parents because the, the full letter is not published, just this part of it, but it's quite telling towards the end there, isn't it, how he's not sorry about what, though? I'm taking he means the crimes. It doesn't, As I say, it doesn't state. The relationship with the parents, is it sort of cool? Is there a bit of a distance between them? Uh, they seem very interested in at least getting his money from his wages. As I say, it's very hard to tell just from a letter. I'm just trying to read it between the lines. It's a shame, isn't it? He could have done so much in life, Eugen. He really could have. He had the intelligence. He had learnt a few languages. He could have even been a real estate agent like Les Aubre and made a lot more money at it. So why did he choose a life of crime? And not just a life of crime, but to take people's lives so callously. It's like they're a product to be used and then disposed of. Uh, that always intrigues me about such killers, that they can be so charming on the outside, so likable, so sociable, and such horrible monsters on the inside to do something like that. Very strange. He really could have done so much with his life. 
God had gifted him with not only a a nice appearance, but also, you know, an intelligent and uh, likable persona. When I discussed the details of this case with Odette uh, about, you know, what he could have done in life with all the things that were on his side, Odette just said, Er hatte den Drang dazu, which means he, he had the urge to do it. You know, it, it wasn't really about the money even. I guess he just enjoyed killing. That's, that's the terrible thing. There wasn't that much to be made out of it uh, once he was divided amongst the other people in the gang. Uh, yeah, he just wanted to kill. The actual road to Tours in France, where Coffey the chauffeur was killed, I've been along that road, actually. I've driven along that road a few times. I didn't even know about the case at that time, so I wonder if Mr. Coffey's ghost is still there. So we can see by these newspaper snippets that they found other belongings at the villa. Uh, doesn't wasn't really a huge place, was it? But they call them villas. Um, yeah, so that it was most probable there were other victims. I guess they just couldn't prove who was murdered. Maybe the bodies were not discovered. It was a lot harder to trace people back then. Uh, people just disappeared. Happened a lot. So I'm guessing that they were responsible for more killings and were only going to admit to the ones where the bodies were found. Also, where he stated that Jean de Coven uh, went down like a doll, that she just sort of went limp in his hands, I found a newspaper snippet while doing my research which would contradict his claim. Have a read of this. So it says here that Weidman said he strangled the first victim Miss de Coven, to get money for food. An autopsy on the body of the Brooklyn girl showed she put up a terrific struggle before the hands of her slayer and his cord garrot brought death. So he was just sort of implying that he put his hands around her neck and she just fell limp and died. Obviously she really struggled for her life. And so finally he realized that uh, it wasn't going to go as easily as he thought it would and so resorted to the cord garrot to finish her off. And I believe he wrote to the parents basically saying that her honor was intact. In other words, he hadn't violated her before or after death. But uh, yeah, I think he's just trying to paint a bit of a, a nicer picture regarding her final moments. Very sad. Yes, regarding the animated execution guillotine scene at the start, and I also included it during the video, I actually created that animation from a vintage photo for the Peter Curtin serial killer video, also a German serial killer. There wasn't uh, an actual photo of Peter Curtin's execution, so I used Eugen Weidmann's execution, so I didn't have to recreate another animation, in case you were wondering if you had seen it before on my videos. Yes, what really annoyed me about this case is that all of the victims, except for perhaps Frommer, were just law-abiding citizens going about their life trying to further themselves, like the chauffeur, like the real estate agent, the director, the private nurse, and uh, Jean, who was wanting to, you know, have a career in dancing and acting, trying to get ahead in life, with no thought that some monster, who didn't look like a monster, is going to come into their life and end it, and just end their life for really not much. That, that really annoys me, actually. Yeah, at that time, the French police were not required to carry a weapon, and they could have a gun, but they had to pay for it themselves. So a lot of them didn't or couldn't afford to, to do that. So that's why those two detectives had no gun and had a very lucky escape. Obviously, quick thinking, reflexes, and just attacked, because if, if they hadn't, he, he would have killed them. Yeah, but he wasn't really trying to hide anything, was he? They had the, the, the victims' cars in the back garden, going into town and, and playing dominoes or whatever they play in France, boule. Very, very, uh, very callous. Well... I think on that note, my dear viewers, we have discussed the case at length. Let me know your thoughts. I'm always interested. I bid you good night or good morning wherever you are, or good day, and I'll see you next time. Take care, God bless, and bye-bye.